Good morning. morning. Welcome to worship at Hazelwood Christian Church. Whether you are with us in our beautiful church or online, we're so happy you are joining us today to hear the word of God, to praise him and give him thanks. On Saturday, February 17th, Muncie Mission's annual Walk a Mile in My Shoes will be held. The purpose of the event is to briefly walk in the shoes of the homeless. When I have helped out with meals for homeless men at Christian Ministries Sleeping Room, I have a hard time comprehending that when I leave to go home to my warm house and comforts, they have nowhere to go. You can walk in support on the 17th or and or you can make a contribution after worship today to support a walker. All proceeds support the Muncie Mission and the tremendous work they do. If you are able to help, write a check separate from your regular offering and mark it Walk a Mile on the memo line. Also after worship today, you are invited to the library area for Holy Grounds, a time of fellowship and refreshments. A face that you see each and every week but have never spoken to, this is your chance. You are welcome. Thank you, Mary Ann. Hello. I decided to wear my Noah's Ark um, stole today, the uh, covenant of the rainbow at the end of the rain, in hopes that maybe, maybe the sun will shine here soon. There are many reasons to gather and to worship God. I'm sure that each of you present in the sanctuary and online have your own reasons, perhaps to be in community, perhaps to offer praise and thanksgiving to the Creator to be consoled or encouraged, or to offer contrition, and to open our minds, our hearts, and our souls to the wonder of all that is the God of love. Let us worship together.
That was beautiful, Mariana. Thank you. Please join me in the call to worship, which comes from Psalm 19. You, Lord, are to be blessed. Teach us your statutes. We will not forget what you have said. Be good to your servants so we can go on living and keeping your word. Open our eyes so we can examine the wonders of your instruction. It does sound like someone's car is going off. It sounds like it's back here. Wait, it stopped? It stopped. Yay. Okay, it stopped. Good. Okay. Problem solved. <laughs> oh, let us sing our great Redeemer's praise, the glories of our God and King, and the triumphs of God's grace, as we stand as able and sing hymn number five, Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing. And if you would like a hymnal, they're under the chair in front of you on the rack. Let us stand and sing. <laughs> continue singing our opening praise with the praise song, Open the Eyes of My Heart. Shining in the light of your glory, pour out your power. 
Look, Bryn Mawr, you don't even have to call them anymore. They just know to come down. That's awesome. Sorry, I'm not awake this morning. Okay. <laughs> Hello. All right. Good morning, guys. <laughs> okay. Tell me if this scenario sounds familiar. When you're trying to read and you come across a word you don't know, what do you do? Try to sound it out. That's good. Sam, what about you? You don't know? That's okay. Joel, what about you? What do you do? Yeah, that's, that's a good idea. Um, do you ask a parent or a teacher for help? You do that sometimes? Yeah? And uh, what do they say? They tell you? That's good. Yeah? Awesome. Well, I remember when I was still learning to read and I found a word I didn't know how to say or when I was trying to spell a word I didn't know how to spell, I would ask my mom or dad. Now, my dad would usually tell me the answer, uh, which was nice and helpful. But my mom would make me sound it out. She'd ask me questions like, what do you think the word means? And how do you think it's spelled? Ooh. <laughs> I remember getting really frustrated and I just wanted to shout, just tell me the answer. <laughs> but sometimes the answers don't come that easily. In our scripture reading today, Jesus opened the minds of his disciples so that they could understand the scriptures. Wouldn't that be nice, huh? If we could suddenly and perfectly understand every scripture in the Bible. Some parts of the Bible are just hard to wrap your head around, right? Jesus helps us understand scripture through the help of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit helps us understand when we read the scriptures so that we are living in accordance with God's will and purposes. The study of the Bible is very important. When you read your Bible, listen to the Spirit. When the Spirit of Jesus reveals a particular truth to you, write it down. This can be the truth you think about throughout the day. Trust me. There will never be a day when you won't see something new. Let us pray. Lord, thank you for preserving the scriptures for our blessing. Protect us from misunderstanding. Help us to learn and understand the scriptures according to the teaching of your Holy Spirit. And let the reading and understanding of your word be one of life's greatest joys. Amen. The great Danish philosopher Soren Kierkegaard wrote, Prayer does not change God. It changes the one who offers it. If our eyes are closed on the world, perhaps they can be opened to see the world as God sees the world. Join me in singing our prayer hymn, Open My Eyes That I May See.
So let us take a deep breath, close our eyes in preparation for prayer. Let us continue in prayer. God who sees, God who hears, God who feels, open our eyes that we may see your truth so as to be set free. Easier prayed than done, O oh God. Perhaps just give us the strength to glance, to glance at our neighbor, at your word, at the world, and in a brief look, see what you would have us see. We know our looking often looks inward, 
tending to ourselves and to what we have done and to what we want. Forgive us, God, our navel-gazing. In a world that seems content to struggle against itself, blindly striding to the drumbeats of war and wealth and waywardness, make us your servants of seeing, stepping surely to your loving heartbeat. In a world that gorges itself on the instant, demanding the now, make us your witnesses of having enough in your time. And open us to serve the lost, the least of these, and the lonely. Open us to the possibility, to the presence of being fulfilled. Amen. Throughout this sermon series, we are singing a verse from the hymn we call ourselves Disciples as a way to ground our way of evangelism in what it means to be a disciple of Christ. Please join with me in We Call Ourselves Disciples, verse 5, verse 5. Jesus is still opening my mind to understand the scriptures in new and challenging and encouraging ways. Often overlooked by the Great Commission at the end of the Gospel of Matthew, the author of the Gospel of Luke also has Jesus give final instructions to his disciples. Remember Jesus' words in Matthew, go and make disciples teach and baptize. Luke stresses something completely different. Luke chapter 24, verses 44 through 48. Then he said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, Thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. This is the word of the Lord. Are you in need of a breakthrough? Just as Jesus opened the minds of those around him to the scriptures, he can do the same for you and for me. Let Jesus be your breakthrough.
to something new. I'm giving up control. I need a breakthrough. All of my dreams and fears are crashing into you. You're waking up my hope. You are my breakthrough. My breakthrough. Praise band, thank you. We started this sermon series on evangelism with some admonitions as to what not to do when sharing the good news. Don't use magic or sorcery. Don't sacrifice the children to be in relationship with God. And don't sell Bitcoin currency to gullible congregants. Did you read about that story in the news this past week? A Denver, Colorado pastor and his wife are accused of taking $1.3 million, a small sum, out of over $3 million they raised in a worthless cryptocurrency scheme for God. They used the money to buy a Range Rover, some jewelry, some cosmetic dentistry, and for extravagant vacations and to renovate their home. The pastor believed that God had called him to begin this fraudulent investment scheme 
on behalf of the kingdom of God. I, as a minister, cannot fathom raising over $3 million using financial sorcery, sharing the good news. Might be good for one or two who happen to be in power, not so for the hundreds of souls who gave $3 million and were taken and swindled. And this illustrates the challenge of sharing the good news in this cynical age. Who wants to be a part of an institution where these types of shenanigans occur? Or we hear some good news and we put on our skeptical hats, furrow our brows, narrow our eyes, and wonder, is this too good to be true? Or perhaps we are the gullible ones, answering every call to collect cash that comes our way under the guise of good news. And if we feel these ways when we hear some good news, then, so as not to come across as fools when sharing the good news of Jesus' death and resurrection and risk being ostracized for silliness, we simply don't share anything at all. Last week, I encouraged us to step through this fear of being judged by our listener to tell the good news. We took the example of the women at the tomb in the ending of the Gospel of Mark as our guide. The women were afraid. Mark's Gospel ends. We know the women moved through their fear, thank God, and told the story because we have the story to tell ourselves. We also have our own salvation stories to tell of how we were crucified, how we figuratively died, and how we were miraculously resurrected to new life. In doing so, we participate in the story of Jesus Christ. In other words, using the word commission, which we've been using, we are commissioned by Mark, to move through our fears, tell our story. From the Gospel of Matthew, we heard the Great Commission to go and make disciples by teaching and baptizing. This also presumes telling the story. The author of the Gospel of Luke also asks us to tell the story. In one way, Luke is like Matthew in that we are to teach to teach with an emphasis on understanding the scriptures. Come to Bible study on Wednesday morning. One scholar writes, the message of the scriptures is not self-evident. One's mind must be opened to it. In the story we heard from Luke, Jesus opened the disciples' minds to understand the scriptures. The same scholar goes on, and the scriptures are rightly understood only in the light of the resurrection, the death, Jesus' death and resurrection. And once understood, we are then called to move on to proclaim repentance and forgiveness of sins in Christ's name to all the nations. It is one thing to proclaim, open your mind, repent, your sins are forgiven, and quite another thing to live that. I am a firm believer in and have faith in God, Christ, Spirit, and I also believe that we cannot do this faith thing alone. Faith, sharing the good news, and conversion can only happen in the midst of community. Imagine Luke's commissioning request given to the only individual on a deserted island. Is it possible for his or her mind to be opened by themselves? To repent by themselves? To know and preach forgiveness of sins by themselves? As if to turn to yourself and say, eh, you're forgiven. As if we have that power. We need others to open our minds. We need others to sin against and to repent and ask forgiveness of. 
Our life stories are not lived alone in a vacuum on a desert island. The themes found in Luke's commissioning statement are great themes about what it means to be a human being created in the image of God. Learning, growing, opening, repenting, which literally means to take on a greater mind comes from the Greek word metanoia. Meta meaning greater and noia meaning mind or spirit or that deep place of the self. And forgiveness. Once we open ourselves and our minds to a new and greater awareness, we recognize then that we've sinned against God and others in what was previously our smaller and more narrow way of thinking. And then so we seek forgiveness. Aside from romantic comedies, my favorite movies are use these great human themes that Luke tells us about. I love it when a character moves from one way of being to another, learning to live in a new way in relationship with themselves and with others. And along the way, repenting of how their old self hurt others, and then to seek forgiveness. This past week, I rewatched a favorite, Finding Forrester. Have folks seen that? You have your movie recommendation for the week. Finding Forrester. I was tempted for this morning's Sunday service to wheel in a popcorn popping machine to hand out bags of popcorn. Perhaps set up a candy counter to sell some candy bars and offer an investment option or two of heavenly Bitcoin. So as to pay for our new house on Shellbark, excuse me, to raise money for the least of these. (laughs) And to spend a little over two hours in worship watching Finding Forrester to see and experience how the good news of Christ Jesus is lived in the lives of these wonderful movie characters. The movie opens with both main characters living closed off in their own little worlds in the ghetto in the Bronx. The 16-year-old Jamal Wallace is caught up in his difficult life. He has a brilliant mind, and he deliberately and intentionally dumbs himself down in the inner city school just so as to fit in. Jamal is also a basketball standout. The writer, William Forrester, a recluse, wrote a Pulitzer Prize-winning novel and never wrote again. He lives in a rundown building, four floors above the basketball court where Jamal and his friends play. The two meet unexpectedly in Forrester's apartment after Jamal climbs up a fire escape, very symbolic, on a dare to take something from the old man who is always looking down at them from that window. Forrester scares Jamal, who runs away, dropping his backpack, which contains his precious written journals. About this same time, Jamal has also been lured to an exclusive private school in Manhattan, ostensibly because of his high achievement test scores, but also to be the star of their basketball team. The writer Forrester and the writer Jamal develop a a beautiful friendship over the course of the movie. I don't want to give the ending away, but along the way, they each open the eyes of the other in various ways both tapping together on the keys of two typewriters in Forrester's apartment. Forrester teaching Jamal the art and craft of being a writer. Jamal teaching Forrester the art and craft of living again. Both repenting, both seeking forgiveness, and at the end, both victorious in living life. It's a wonderful and redemptive film. I don't know if my life is fit for a Hollywood movie. Are my moments of opening my eyes remarkable enough for a movie script? 
gaining a greater understanding of how to be in relationship with others, seeking forgiveness and forgiving others. Maybe if the movie of my life had three Oscar-winning actors in it, it would be something special. But wait, special. Isn't that part of the good news? Our lives are special in the eyes of God. Our lives are full of drama, comedy, and tragedy in the midst of all of our relationships with other human beings. The author Marilyn Robinson writes, There are a thousand, thousand reasons to live life, every one of them sufficient. For Jamal to discover, accept, and rejoice in his gift of being a writer. For William Forrester to push through death and to fully live life once again. There are a thousand, thousand reasons to live life, every one of them sufficient. Do we live our lives in Christ as if this were true? If not, Open your mind in Christ, take on a greater awareness, seek forgiveness, and know that you have been forgiven by the grace of God. Do we live our lives in Christ as if a thousand, thousand reasons were true? If so, continue to open your mind in Christ, take on a greater awareness, seek forgiveness, and know that you have been forgiven by the grace of God. Amen. When we come to this table that we were once far away from, when we come to this table, we remember that we were once far away from God. But through the act of Holy Communion, we have been brought home to God's family. I invite you to stand if you are able and sing with me verses 1 and 4 of hymn number 400. When you do, uh, don't stand, I'm sorry, don't stand. We're going to stay seated and sing our communion hymn number 400. We heard how Jesus opened the disciples' minds to understand the scriptures. There is another episode of opening in the Gospel of Luke. Remember, at the end of the road to Emmaus, the two followers of Jesus share a meal with him. It is at that meal, right after Jesus takes the bread, blesses it, breaks it, and gives it to him, that Luke tells us their eyes are opened and they recognize him as Jesus. Here at this table, we remember Jesus and recognize him as our companion on the way, our teacher, our Lord and Savior. When the hour came, Jesus took his place at the table and the apostles were with him. He took a loaf of bread, blessed it and broke it and then gave it to them saying, take, eat, this is my body. And in the same manner, after dinner, he took the cup, 
and gave thanks for it, and then gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, drink, this cup is a new covenant in my blood. And so often as you eat of this bread and drink from this cup, remember me. Let us pray. Dear gracious God, we give thanks for the opportunity to come to this table to break bread together. Here at this table, the light of Christ glows with hope, peace, and joy. Here we find our unshakable foundation and strength of faith. Lord, we are called to be advocates for all people, especially those in our community who are vulnerable. Open our hearts and our minds so that your word may be made clear to us. Help us hear Christ's message of love, peace, and unity. Make us strong believers in your message. When Jesus calls us to follow me, let us follow and respond with deeds of action when we see the sick, the hungry, or those without shelter. Now we share this bread and wine in remembrance of Christ our Savior because it is in his cross that we find forgiveness and grace. We thirst for a life with Christ and the strength to follow when he calls. May the memory and presence of Christ's life be real to us as we gather at this table of forgiveness. We pray that our commitment to you may bear fruit in our daily lives in the week ahead. Let our lives be enriched as we practice the teachings of Jesus by serving you and those around us. This morning, we give thanks that you and the Spirit of Christ are with us at all times. With gratitude, Father, we give you thanks for your eternal love and grace. At this time, we ask you to forgive our sins and continue to bless our church and the lives of our family and friends with the love of Christ. Now, let us unite in prayer as we offer the prayer our Savior taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Ordinary bread, ordinary juice, made by ordinary people, served by the extraordinary love of our Savior Jesus. Come, all are welcome at this table.
as we give of our offerings, may we do so in love, in joy, and with thanksgiving. God in Christ has freely given and continues to give freely. May our response to the infinite grace of God provide moments of grace for those in need. Let us pray for our offerings. Holy God, we put before you now our offering. What you offer us is more valuable than any material possessions on this earth. Through the sacrifice of your son, you offer us hope, peace, and redemption. You offer us eternal life. It is right and good that we give to you now a portion of the fruits of our labor and that we give this portion freely and with grateful hearts. We pray that this offering is pleasing to you and that you guide us in using it in the best way possible to spread the light and love of Christ to those all around us. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you. I invite you all to stand as you are able and join me in singing our closing hymn, Open Up the Heavens. Stay. Yeah. 
I invite you to receive the benediction. May God bless you. May God keep you. May God's face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May God lift up God's countenance upon you and give you peace and give